Good morning, everyone. To Dr. Zaleka Zakopo, who is the Chief Director at the National Department of Human Settlements, who will be representing the Honorable Minister Kubai, Honorable Member of the Executive Council, Mr. Sni Motara, and members of the panel and distinguished guests. Mr. Mayele sends his sincere apologies. He has been called to urgent business and won't be able to join us today. But to everyone else, a big warm welcome to our Stakeholders Engagement Forum powered by NAFBI. I am Tracy Lee Burr. I'm the Portfolio Director of the Built Environment at DMG Events. And I have the honor of welcoming you and our dear friends and respected colleagues to what we hope is a milestone event in Africa's built environment. Before we get started, I'd like to express my sincere appreciation to my team and everyone who's generously helped to make the event come together and become a success. That includes the Gauteng Provincial Government, the Department of Human Settlements, all our media and association and knowledge partners, our generous sponsors, APSA, Building Point, Eaton, Huawei, John Deere, Knauf, Namco Guarantees, Nextec, PMSA, Sunrail, SAQCC Gas, and our dear friends at SACA our exhibitors and all of the guests and attendees and phenomenal faculty of over 80 speakers and trainers. Thank you to everyone. We definitely couldn't have done it without you. Isn't innovation through crisis phenomenal? I am amazed at the fact that a, half, a year and a half ago, I didn't even know what Zoom was, let alone that I think that the eighth edition of African Construction and Totally Concrete would be held on a digital platform. Not only would the digital platform allow exhibitors to showcase the materials and information, but it would also allow us to share business cards, set up meetings, have one-on-one -on -one face to face chats, allow us to showcase our content on several different streams at the same time, all across the globe. It's absolutely phenomenal and blows my mind at what we've learned in the last few months, let alone a couple of weeks. Two years ago, my daughter's school credo was stronger together. Little did I know then how important those two words would become to me as an individual, as my family, as here at DMG events, as our industry, and for our country as a whole. The pandemic has had far reaching effects with some of our clients having to sadly close our doors, not to mention the loss of family members, colleagues, and dignitaries. Today is not about handing over business cards, having a good networking session and maybe making some lucrative business. Today is really about us uniting as an industry from all over the globe and saying that we have the strength and the resilience to keep moving forward despite ever shifting goals. Transformation and SME development plays a critical role in building and advancing innovation in the industry. But it's not the responsibility of one entity or one organization. It really does include all of us and a transformation from within the sector. With strong emphasis on transformation, recovery, economic growth and job creation, enterprise development and youth development, timing is opportune in the South African context in particular, as it takes place in the wake of the Department of Public Works and Infrastructure gazetting the National Infrastructure Plan 2050, which is released for public comment comment. Ladies and gentlemen, we have bold expectations for the next few days. Expectation heightened by the fact that we are joined from people all across the globe with many, many knowledgeable speakers with a lot of experience and of course our wonderful exhibitors. With that, it gives me a big, great pleasure to hand over to our friend and industry giant, Aubrey Chalata. Aubrey, I am definitely going to have to read your wire out because it is as long as the, the um, achievements are. So, Mr. Aubrey Chalata is the national president of um, NAFBI, the National African Federation for the Building Industry. And he is an entrepreneur, business leader, a transformation activist, and lobbyist. The industry giant holds many educational accolades. He has successfully completed the blow. Um, qualifications to name a few, a master in commerce, a BA in industrial psychology, postgraduate diploma, employment law and social security amongst others. His educational qualifications certainly speak volumes. However, there are many facets to this individual and one of them is being an impeccable leader. 
Besides an array of impressive educational accomplishments, Mr. Gelata is an exceptional leader and has acquired many titles during his outstanding career. Some of his career highlights include, but are not limited to, CEO of Palcard Group of Companies, the Chairperson of the Board, African Center for Economic Empowerment and Entrepreneurship and Development, the Chairperson of Finance for ML Sultan Technicon Council, Council Member of the Business Unity South Africa, Lead Negotiator at the Construction Industry Transformation Charter, Member of the Presidential Infrastructure Task Team, and he serves on numerous, numerous boards and uh, councils in the public and private sector. One such achievement is Mr. Chalata's representation of the construction sector at the PPGI, which is the Private and Public Sector Growth Initiative, with the intention of enhancing private sector investment of the economy. Over to you, Aubrey. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tracy. Thank you uh, for the warm words of welcome. Uh, let me take this opportunity to greet um, all panelists, the leaders of government here present. Uh, greetings to my friend and colleague, Mr. Webster Febe, who is going to be moderating this session today. Uh, colleagues uh, in the industry, industry leaders, uh, contractors, uh, built environment professionals, uh, members of NAVB, uh, members of various industry associations, uh, uh, many uh, uh, friends and colleagues from within South Africa and outside of South Africa. Let me first take this opportunity, Tracy, to congratulate the DMP team on a job well done, uh, not only this year, but over the years in preparing and organizing this platform, which has become a very critical platform for our sector to engage on critical issues of the day and look into the future of our industry and how we want to move forward. Uh, indeed, um, it's been a very challenging time uh, where we are today, uh, but as the DMG team always does, you've uh, stood up to the occasion and you've presented a very formidable platform for us to engage. Colleagues, we meet at a time when our country and the world is facing numerous challenges. Amongst these challenges is the pandemic that continues to ravage society and the world. The pandemic has brought with it loss of lives. We've lost many of our loved ones. We've also lost um, opportunities in the economy. Many economies around the world have been devastated by the pandemic. We also meet at a time where we have a very serious challenge of joblessness, especially youth unemployment. I have over the period said this is a ticking time bomb that we urgently need to take care of. Many of us who sit in comfortable offices, I suggest it's about time now that we step out of our offices and fold our sleeves and prepare ourselves for a very serious task of creating employment for the thousands of our young people who are moving around in the streets with their CVs without employment. So the second challenge indeed is the challenge of youth unemployment. The third challenge is the challenge of rampant corruption and greed. We have this very challenge that is creeping into our society. We have leaders today who are in it for themselves and not in it to serve the good of humanity. This has been demonstrated in a number of ways, less amongst those, the kind of expose we have seen in South Africa in the Zondo Commission on state capture. We also have a very huge challenge, colleagues of gender-based violence. This is, as we speak today in the Eastern Cape, in the University of Forte, have challenges of uh, women being killed by men and the absence of men and a army of men who are going to say, not in my name. We also have a challenge of racism and inequality that affects uh, not only South Africa, but the entire globe. Colleagues, given these challenges, as NAFP, we've opted to host with the African Construction Expo and Totally Concrete, and which is also co-located or where in the SACAP convention is co-located, we've decided to host this year on a theme of leadership. We think it's, this country requires leadership more than ever before. 
I, I recall that at some stage in the book of John in the Bible, when Christ was to leave, he asked his disciples or they asked him, um, please tell us when you are no longer with us, who of us shall be the greatest? Instead of responding, Christ Jesus at that time took the initiative of saying, come one by one, let me wash your feet. In washing their feet, they wondered what the message was. And in response, he said, I am doing this to indicate to you that the greatest amongst you shall be your servant. It is our submission as NAFPI today that if we are to look for a particular kind of leadership today, that kind of leadership has to be what I call the servant leadership. The greatest amongst us must be our servants. We have a cadre of leadership today that are about serving themselves and not serving humanity. We want to make a call during this particular conference that it is about time that we inculcate the culture of servant and leadership. This is the kind of leadership where people do not look into their own benefit, but look into the common good. And, in, and remember at all given times that theirs is to serve. We also require ethical leadership at this particular time. Ethical leadership as has been witnessed in a number of incidents and we see every day in our television screen is a missing kind of leadership in our country and the world. Leaders of today have no moral and uh, character and code. They operate as though the citizens that they are responsible to were not there to help hold them to account. So we need to inculcate the idea of ethical leadership. We also colleagues need to look into visionary leadership. These times call for visionary leaders. These times call for leaders who are going to tell us how the tomorrow uh, we are wanting will be looking like, what tomorrow holds for us. People who will be able to see what it is that our young people will inherit from the kind of society that we have today. We lack these visionary leaders in our society today. I want to also suggest that we want to have accountable leadership a leadership that accounts to those that have put them into power. It is not a top-down approach that we are looking for. It should be a bottom-up approach. Even at the level of local government, as we get closer to local government elections, our quest is to be able to identify leaders that will lead with a sense of accountability, answerable there to those people who elected them into those very positions they assume. Society must begin to identify these kind of leaders and create space for these leaders to be able to lead them. Society must also take responsibility for the kind of leaders that they have allowed to lead them. We can no longer recycle the old and hope for a better uh, result. We have seen the challenges of the past. We have seen the problems that have arisen as a result of the kind of leaders that we've allowed to lead society, both in public and private sector. We have seen collusion in our sector as a result of leaders that we've allowed to lead our sector. We have seen lack of transformation and change in our sector because of the leaders that we've allowed to lead our sector. We've seen in society various challenges of corruption, malfeasance. We've seen various challenges of rampant looting of state coffers, as well as private sector challenges of fraud and corruption because of the kind of leaders that we've allowed to lead us. We make a submission today that it is important for society to determine what kind of a leader we want to put forward to lead us. So citizens must take full responsibility for the kind of leaders that they allow to lead them. Given the expose colleagues in the Zondo Commission, we must ask hard questions, questions about who we allow to lead us. If we have not learned from anything else, let us learn from the revelations that have come out of the Zondo Commission and in future be cautious who in fact we put forward to lead our country, to lead our sector, to lead our industry and to lead our society. Given the incidents of looting and destruction in Wazulu Natal and Gauteng recently, we must ask questions about how we are led. We must ask questions about the efficiency of the state. We must ask questions about the relevance of some of the state institutions and how effective they are in protecting and the interest of citizens and ensuring that our very livelihoods are protected and that we as citizens feel safe in our own country and in our own homes. 
Given the ongoing matter of women and children colleagues, we must ask serious questions about our inaction. We must, as men, stand together and ask the question, where were we when these young boys, girls were being killed and their bodies mutilated in the way that we've seen on national television? What have we done to educate our young boys about how to treat women? Have we been fathers that are responsible in teaching our sons how a woman must be treated? And we must stand together as men and provide leadership first at the level of family and provide leadership second at the level of community, society, the country, and the world. The absence of men, the absence of fathers in the home has resulted in the kind of a son that we see today, one that believes that a woman is to be killed and her body mutilated. We stand now in solidarity with many women who are facing these challenges on a day by day basis. Given the lack of transformation colleagues in the economy, we must ask hard questions about the sustainability of the status quo. The recent incidents, as I indicated, that have ravaged our country in the not too distant past indicates that there is a ticking time bomb and that there is a restlessness amongst our communities. One of the key focus areas that we are focusing on as NAFPI this year in this particular conference is putting a special focus on township and rural economy. We want to ask the question, have we done enough? One, to ensure youth employment and to mobilize our young people. I must say colleagues that I do fear and I want people to mark my words from this time on that the next challenge that this country is going to face is the challenge of a revolt by young people who are leaving universities without employment, leaving TVET colleges without employment. Those young people are going to ask very serious questions of us as to what is it that you prepare for us. It is one thing to celebrate free education, but it is another to ensure that industry and the private sector are ready to welcome those young people into employment. We want to make a call that all of us as leaders must begin to focus on this very serious challenge of youth unemployment and graduate unemployment and township revitalization of the township economy as well as, well as rural economy. We cannot sit in comfort side by side with poverty, with challenges of people who go to bed without food. The number of young people, youth for that matter, and very young boys and girls who ran around the streets looting, going into shopping malls, indicated that a we're a society that has degenerated into a situation where our young people see it fit themselves that they can go and loot, that they can go and take that which does not belong to them. But the level of desperation has enabled them to be utilized or to be manipulated by those who seek to achieve their own goal and their own ends in our society. Women must live up to the reality colleagues of the slogan, and they must do so beyond the slogan. You strike a woman, you strike a rock. That slogan must be translated into real action. We need to begin to see our women in the streets dealing with the very challenges that confront our sector, that confront our society, and that confront the country as a whole. SMME development is a critical focus of our conference this year. We've always said we need to focus on small towns, on villages, on rural areas and be able to mobilize SMMEs in those particular areas, because we all know that SMMEs are creators of employment and we need that employment desperately at this particular time. SMMEs are also critical for innovation and creativity. I am particularly pleased that the DMG team and the African Construction and Totally Concrete Expo this year has brought on board even young people through the Youth Advisory Board, as well as a number of SMMEs that are exhibiting at this particular conference. We welcome all of you, and we think that we look forward to innovation, we look forward to creativity, we look forward to you stepping forward and creating the jobs that we so desperately need. In this sense, ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you to this conference, the NAFPI Leadership Conference co-hosted with the African Construction Expo and Totally Concrete um, and also the SACA Convention. We look forward in the next few days to hearing a range of presentations and workshops. This afternoon, NAFPI will host a transformation dialogue with a range of speakers from private sector and public sector. And in that particular dialogue, we will be investigating and interrogating the issue of uh, transformation in our country. It now gives me great pleasure, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, having welcomed all of you, and thank you for taking your time to join us here today to introduce a friend, a colleague, a legal leader of our sector, Mr. Webster Mfebe. Mr. Mfebe is a leader of our sector. 
For those of you who are not aware, he is a chief executive officer of the South African Federation for Civil Engineering Contractors. Webster leads uh, a sector that accounts for about 70% of our industry, the civil engineering sector. He is a champion of the sector on a range of issues. In fact, I dare say that without the existence of a caliber of a leader of Webster and Febe, this sector would have delayed going back to work during the hard lockdown. This man has worked tirelessly behind the scenes to try and get the sector back to work when it was a level five lockdown. It is Webster and Febe who has stepped forward even when the country was burning with the so-called construction mafia stopping projects and interrupting projects on the street. He went into meetings with people with guns in their hands, and this leader was there to represent the sector and lobby for, the, for calm and order, working with the police services, working with security council, working with a number of state organs to ensure that the sector went back to work peacefully. Mr. Webb Samfebe is a well-respected chief executive officer, not only in South Africa, but also in Africa. He has received numerous awards, one of them being the C, one of the top CEOs in Africa award. I must say, Webster also leads one of the major investment projects in the country, the LEAP, the Lipombo Eco Industrial Project. This is a multi-billion project in Lipombo that is focusing on building a range of infrastructure in that particular part of the world. The Lipombo Eco Industrial Park has been cited as one of the major projects in the presidential uh, investment conference and has been listed as that particular uh, in that conference as one of the key projects that will create jobs that will boost the economy. And Webster Febe is chairman of the Lipombo Eco Industrial Park. It now gives me great pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to welcome this giant of our sector, Mr. Webster Febe, who will be moderating this particular uh, session. Thank you very much. Over to you, Webster. Thank you very much, uh, uh, NAFPI President uh, Aubrey Chalada for generously introducing me. Esteemed delegates and panelists, the theme for this stakeholder engagement session is economic recovery for inclusive growth. There are two operative phrases embedded side by side in this theme, which are economic recovery and inclusive growth. It is common cause that the South African economy is currently in doldrums with low growth and rising unemployment, poverty and inequality due to the impact of COVID-19 and pre-COVID-19 challenges that saw our country being downgraded to a sub-investment grade status. It is therefore imperative that we embark on an infrastructure-led economic recovery and such a recovery must be accompanied by inclusive growth because growth for some is growth for none. Even the Bretton Woods institutions such as the World Bank and IMF on the one hand and the ratings agencies on the other are unanimous that infrastructure investment is a single most effective strategy to plug South Africa's development and health gap in order to address the rising population growth poverty, unemployment, and inequality. This is especially so because South Africa is the most unequal society in the world and investment in infrastructure can positively change this unfortunate trajectory. Many a good document so far developed on infrastructure and economic recovery are littered with good English, but could we just practically translate this good English in an inclusive way so that the majority of marginalized South Africans can have the taste and the toast of the English breakfast at their own tables. Because people do not eat promises and good intentions contained in blueprint publications, however attractive they may seem, they eat bread and butter. Neither do they eat democracy. They want an equitable share in the democracy dividend that was ushered in 1994 with a promise of inclusivity and a better life for all. This is not to negate any notable gains attained since the advent of democracy in our country, but rather to highlight the fact that a lot still has to be done to meet the developmental needs of all South Africans on an equitable basis. It is therefore quite evident that the pursuit and achievement of social justice 
through an inclusive economic growth stands a better chance of mobilizing society to take care of their own destiny on an equitable basis. This is the task not only reserved for the government, but by all social partners, including business, labor, and civil society. Such an environment will also ensure an inclusive economic success for all. Therefore, I am in complete agreement with and support for the National Treasury when they say a growth-oriented policy must be accompanied by interventions that change how the benefits of growth are distributed and fundamentally transform the systems and pattern of ownership and control that govern our economy. Initiatives that transform the economy must meet the dual tests of sustainability and intergenerational equity. In other words, economic transformation must be implemented in a manner that does not compromise the long-term ability of our economy to compete in global uh, product and labor markets. This means that at the heart of our economic policy must be a concurrent emphasis on economic transformation, inclusive growth, and competitiveness, as this offers the most sensible strategy to address the challenges of unemployment, poverty, and inequality. I am now commencing with the stakeholder engagement protocols, ladies and gentlemen. I therefore humbly advise the stakeholders and panelists to comply with the following procedure. Each panelist is allowed a maximum of five minutes to share their inputs with us on the theme of the session, which is economic recovery for inclusive growth. Stakeholders, please, note down and submit your questions during the brief input of each panelist. You must please start by stating your full name and the organization you represent, or just in your personal capacity. Uh, please uh, indicate uh, the panelist to whom you are directing your question. Uh, five, in order to maximize stakeholder engagement for each round of questions, each stakeholder is allowed only one question per panelist with a minimum, with, with a time permitting, uh, more questions may be allowed in subsequent rounds. As a moderator, I will ask the first round of questions to each panelist in order to lay the ground for stakeholder engagement. Panelists are requested to be brief in their answers with a view to maximizing stakeholder engagement. I will now introduce each esteemed panelist with their current titles before I call upon them to present their inputs on the same session, uh, on the theme of the same session. In the interest of time, their biographies will be available on the website. Uh, with me, I have an esteemed panel of uh, guests. They are uh, Dr. Zoleka Sokoko, Chief Director, National Department of Human Settlements, uh, Honorable MEC Tazrim Mutara, MEC of Houting Department of Infrastructure and Development, uh, and uh, NAFP President Aubrey Chalata. Uh, Dr. Julia Peter, Managing Director, Amezo Trading and NAFB Board Member, and Mr. Sabelo Butele is the Chief Director, Special Project Unit Department of Higher Education. I now present to you uh, the representative of the Minister of Human Settlements, uh, Dr. Zole Gasokopo. Uh, Chief Director, National Department of Human Settlement. Your maximum time is five minutes. You may take even one minute or two. Uh, over to you uh, to present your thoughts on the, the theme of our session. Uh, thank you very much. And also thank you for, for inviting us. Um, we agree with you that um, infrastructure um, uh, in the construction sector in particular is important in contributing to economic recovery. Uh, 
that um, we have uh, even before uh, COVID hit us. We we all know that we have suffered um, a, a, a economic decline. And in that, uh, the Department of Human Settlements and the human settlements uh, sector as a whole decided that let us then start um, uh, 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 making sure that our contribution has got a greater impact by deciding where we need to invest instead of in investing everywhere. We selected and gathered 136 spaces where we wanted uh, to invest. And within these 136 spaces, we have 8,317 8, 8, uh, projects that are currently running and others that are still being packaged. But more importantly, what I would like to talk to you about is also a, a, a strategic um, infrastructure projects that are, um, have been gazetted in partnership with the Department of um, uh, Infrastructure and Public Works. And Human Settlements alone is contributing about 126 billion uh, in these projects. And where are these projects? They are in various uh, provinces. Ma majorly, they are in Gauteng. As, as you know, as well as the, 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 the spaces that we're talking about, they are also throughout the, 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 the provinces and also the major uh, uh, centers, which means your eight metropolitan areas. And also one of the, uh, what I also want to highlight, all this is also done in with other partnerships. We are establishing partnership with uh, public entities like ESCOM with regards to input uh, land, um, which is important in terms of, of uh, infrastructure development. We have uh, also other state-owned entities like Translet that we have also agreed to a, a partnership agreement with regard to development and also ensuring that there's land available. Um, I would also want to highlight that uh, within the spaces that we're talking about, we have uh, almost 2,000 informal settlements. I think we all know those are the centers of poverty, deprivation, uh, injustice, inequality, and all that. Uh, I am responsible to ensure that then these informal settlements are upgraded, which means we need, uh, the, there is a budget uh, over the next three years of about 12 billion, where we would then ensure that there's infrastructure, your bulk infrastructure and reticulation, water, sanitation facilities, uh, ensuring that there's proper roads and co connector roads and internal roads, ensuring that then uh, there is a viable uh, sector in terms of economy, whether we're supporting the people that live there to ensure that there are trading spaces within within the informal settlements. And mostly, uh, what I would also like to highlight is the issue that with COVID, we have seen that there is also a high demand and a need for rental accommodation. And that is where also our efforts have been, um, have, uh, we emphasize in that effort and ensure that then we're not only focusing on people that are already working and also providing a rental to uh, four students that are in various tertiary institutions. We've also learned that uh, infrastructure uh, uh, when uh, uh, during the course of uh, providing these different uh, infrastructure, uh, we also have uh, this direct and indirect impact such as building material uh, mm. from labor market as, as well as professional services. And we also see that when all is completed, even the people themselves start to, to, to stimulate the economy in the form of people now buying appliances because now they have um, a, um, access to energy and, and, and water. They start um, to also even expand on the accommodation that they, they receive. And the informal settlements upgrading itself is is not a housing uh, construction, is ensuring that the, the living conditions of people have been improved, which means then that you provide, you start by providing people with security of tenure and also well-planned well uh, uh, settlements and ensuring that they have access to title deed and all uh, that is required for them to start now uh, maybe not wait, but start building for, for themselves. With that, um, um, uh, um, uh, uh, chairperson, I would say maybe I should stop here, but I would just uh, want to also emphasize that 
where we want to, we 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 decided to invest we have done an analysis that is over 70 percent of the total population of this country especially the deprived population uh, that's where it resides and i would like to thank you very much uh, uh, thank you very much uh, Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, I now present to you, uh, if uh, she is available, uh, the Honorable Tasmin Motara, MEC for the Department of Infrastructure Development in Gauteng, who will also share her thoughts with us. Over to you, Honorable MEC. Um, good morning um, to Mr. Febe, as well as the leadership of um, all the institutions represented here today. Um, and thanks again for having us and inviting me to this um, session. It's not for the first time that we engage um, on these matters. I think importantly, just to give my contribution to the topic, is to indicate that um, I think we believe in government that the only way to achieve transformation is to um, establish um, set-asides as well as targets that all of us must meet. So in terms of transformational targets, we have um, set them um, and they've been increased over time. Um, so those would be for youth, people with disabilities, military veterans, um, women, um, etc. So, so, and we are held um, to 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 those standards as well as the the sector set asides. I think, in terms of the the, the government pipeline projects um, given to us across the the various departments in the provincial government, um, provincial government itself has set aside sixty five million um, sixty five billion sorry over the next five years. And that is a combination of social and economic infrastructure. So the rollout of SEZs, uh, which is currently happening, and the social infrastructure projects that are currently on the ground and planned. Um, of course, there is an issue and a concern around technical capacity within government. Um, and we are partnering with um, various institutions of higher learning, as well as the various um, councils, to be able to ensure that one, those that we recruit um, do meet the requirements of the technical environment and the build environment space, um, but also that there's continuous uh, professional development. Um, so as part of just capacity, capacitating government, making sure that that internal capacity is not lost, um, that continues to be a priority. So um, of course, the councils would be responsible for one aspect. We are responsible for a certain aspect in terms of giving um, experience and opportunities for the professionals that we have employed. And I think uh, the Department of Infrastructure Development has employed quite a number of professionals and in the space, um, various departments that um, are responsible for infrastructure, whether it's human settlements, whether it's roads and transport, um, even at a technical level, such as treasury, are now also required to be able to employ um, these people with these types of skills. I think for us, of course, yes, you, you mentioned the issue just around the lack of service delivery. And I think um, it's about making sure that the, um, the planning process in government is not as cumbersome as it currently is, and look at ways to, of minimizing um, the bureaucracy, um, improving on turnaround times, because that ultimately will improve um, the service delivery on the ground. Um, and of course, coupled to that is improvements in the payment systems of contractors. Um, so, of course, in the province, we've introduced um, e-invoicing as a system. Um, contractors are, and service providers, even if you're not a contractor, just a general service provider, even if you're pro so providing services for goods and services, are trained on the system to be able to upload um, the invoices, it tracks it, um, it's paid within 30 days, and this also human, um, minimizes the human interaction. We do believe that with minimal human interaction, you then also reduce um, aspects and areas of, of, of unethical behavior. Um, so I've touched on just a few areas that you spoke about um, and given just um, within the five minutes that we were given. 
um, just to be able to give a highlight of what um, what we are doing. And of course, in the question and answer session, we'll be able to go into detail. Thanks so much, Ribster. Uh, thank you, Honorable Minister. I now call upon Mr. Aubrey Chalada, NAFPI President, to share with us his uh, views on the matter. Over to you, President. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Mfebe. Uh, I, I have made a few comments earlier, but let me uh, thank you once more for allowing us to make inputs on this very subject of um, recovery and for inclusive growth. Now, one of the things that I want to state up front is that NAFPE represents to date about 7,014 members across the board. These include 80% of SMMEs in the construction sector in all nine provinces. We also have about 700 young people who have graduated from tertiary institutions. Uh, these include um, project managers, construction managers, regional and town planners who are awaiting registration in the built environment councils uh, to be allowed to uh, operate. The membership of NAFPI is predominantly in small towns, in villages, in rural areas, in townships. So when we talk about recovery in the NAFPI context, our focus continues to be that where poverty really is rampant is in the villages, is in the townships, is in the informal settlements, it's in rural areas. And we are the organization that reaches out to those particular areas. I do want to state that um, there is always a, 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 a challenge that when discussions are held around the recovery of the economy and particularly around inclusive, inclusivity of the growth that we are aspiring for, there is always a sense that the majority uh, most representative organizations who represent these um, uh, contractors, thousands of them, who represents young people, uh, professionals, thousands of them, are not on the table. The challenge has always been that there are individuals with loud voices um, who represent nobody, who are always um, uh, uh, utilizing the opportunity to claim to represent um, the sector when in fact, they represent their own uh, interests. It is for this reason that I think the first thing that we need to focus on is the challenge of the driver of this recovery uh, agenda. The driving of the recovery agenda needs to happen with labor unions involved, with uh, the likes of NAFPI who represent the majority of black business in the sector, the likes of SAFSEC who represent the majority of the established sector in the uh, uh, context of infrastructure and these people and many other associations that are, are, are available, professional associations, the likes of SACAP and others who represent professionals in our sector need to be on the table. We need to have very inclusive um, a, a, a table that sits and discusses the recovery plan. Secondly, our focus is on the issue of township and rural economy. Colleagues, we want to make a suggestion that it is no longer time for lip service um, around these particular issues of rural and township economy. The development of the township economy is a promise. What we've seen in the townships like Soweto, Umla, Zilanga, Nyanga, Kukuletu, Mtanzani in the Eastern Cape and so forth and so forth has been that there has been growing poverty in the township because many of the then old black businesses that were uh, uh, thriving in the townships have been replaced by malls, have been replaced by uh, external businesses and many black businesses who own those businesses, the likes of the malls like um, uh, Maponya Mall in Soweto, those who own those businesses are finding themselves on the sidelines of the economy. So it is our challenge that if we are to talk about recovery for inclusive growth, we need to reach out to rural areas. We need to reach out to townships. We need to reach out to villages and informal settlements and begin to assist. One of the programs that NAFP is involved in is mentorship of SMMEs. We are at the moment involved with Sandra in mentoring in excess of about 1,000 SMMEs that are tendering with Sandra. We are very excited at the results we are seeing that many of the SMMEs we've mentored over the past three, four years are now reaping the benefits of that mentorship and are taking up a, a chunk of um, Sandral projects that are out in the market at the moment. So SMME mentorship is absolutely critical. I have also uh, alluded to the issue of youth, uh, employment and youth unemployment. The challenge with this is that we need to step forward. One of the things that NAFPI has been 
engaged in over the period towards recovery is partnering with a number of sector education and training authorities, the CITAS, to be able to train. To date, we've trained thousands of young people in learnerships, in short skills, and we've also taken the responsibility responsibility of placing a number of learners in the workplace. We've asked employers, particularly 7,000 of our members, to open their doors for youth employment. And we've been implementing what we call work integrated learning wheel and placing students from TVET colleges, students from universities of technology and universities in employment. Because our view is that you cannot say to young people they must have experience, but as the sector and as the industry, we do not provide those opportunities for them to be able to access that particular experience. One of the the very exciting projects that NAFB has been involved in over the years has been the one for candidacy. The graduates who graduate in project management, construction management, regional and town planning, and other professions in the sector find it difficult for them to succeed when they get into the built environment councils. They need mentors to mentor them and guide them into professional registration status. We are to date at NAFB involved in mentoring about 60 of these candidate project managers and construction managers. And we are pleased to announce that of the cohorts that we've been mentoring, we have about 11 that have now registered as professionally registered construction managers. This has been as a result of our persistent mentoring. Minister uh, MEC Mutara did mention something around the issue of uh, technical capacity at municipalities. It is our view that if we partner uh, together as the sector, we should be able to bring the necessary technical capacity that is lacking in municipalities through the candidacy program. In other words, through mentoring construction project managers, as well as regional and town planners through uh, those municipalities. NAPP has also signed an agreement with the Municipal Infrastructure Support Agency, MIS to be able to provide technical capacity at municipalities in the rollout of projects. It is in these kind of contexts that we find ourselves being able to move forward. We've also signed agreements with the Department of Higher Education and Training. Mr. Buteles is here present, who has uh, facilitated and supported NAFB in this regard. We are focusing specifically on critical skills and, and, and using the dual apprenticeship program that uh, the Department of Higher Education is promoting in the centers of specialization. This country needs plumbers, it needs bricklayers, it needs electricians, it needs um, various technical artisanal skills. And many young people will get a lot of employment. Countries like Germany have done extremely well in ensuring that, and China, in ensuring that young people are developed as artisan. So NAFP is very seized and focused with artisan development. And as I say, together with the Department of Higher Education and Training, we are doing that. Finally, we are already starting a program of lecturer development, because one of the key things we believe needs to be done is to develop the very lecturers who train students in these particular institutions so that they understand the latest technology in industry and be able to relate to what industry's demands are today. So that the kind of a student that they produce out of university out of TVET colleges and out of universities of technology is a student that is a fit within the sector. So we've taken a number of lecturers across the tertiary institutions into what we call a lecturer development program. And we're exposing them to industry so that they may be able to understand what is it that industry requires and take that particular expertise back into the training rooms or into the lecture rooms where they lecture. So in a nutshell, I'm saying we are focused on women empowerment. We are focused on youth mentorship of youth enterprise we are focused on candidacy programs for candidacy programs. We are focused on mentoring SMMEs, not only with Sandra, but across the uh, uh, sector so that they be, they be able to ensure that they succeed when they get given these projects. Many SMMEs do get projects, but fail to execute technically when they are on site. Even with the human settlement space, we are mentoring uh, contractors there so that they can deliver uh, timelessly within budget on their particular projects because they do need somebody to handhold them to ensure that they are going to be able to succeed. It is this kind of mentorship, handholding and coaching and guidance that we think will enable recovery in the long term. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Febe, for allowing us the opportunity to share our thoughts on these subjects. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, President. We now call upon uh, Dr. Petla, Managing Director of Amazon Trading and an NAFP board member to share her thoughts with us. Over to you, Dr. Petla. 
Thank you, Mr. Mfibi, the president of um, NAFBI, Mr. Aubrey Chalata, Dr. Zoleka Skopo, chief national director of the Human Settlement, MEC of Infrastructure Development and Property Management in Gauteng, Ms. Tazne Mutara, fellow panelists, Mr. Butelezi, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed. Um, as introduced by the moderator, I'm Dr. Julia Petra, the founder and managing director of Amazon Trading and Projects. We provide 10 key solutions within the construction fraternity. Our headquarters is in uh, Gauteng Centen. We also have a national footprint in Limpopo, uh, Musena to be precise, which is my home base, um, Pumalanga, and, um, Pumalanga and KwaZulu Natal, um, respectively. Before I share my thoughts, um, moderator, allow me to share my own journey as a woman in a male dominated industry. The industry is not for the faint hearted, it is harsh and not conducive uh, for women to thrive. It requires resilience, patience, commitment, hard work um, and, and passion to remain relevant and competitive amidst the challenges. People often think that the construction industry is one of the easiest industry uh, for a quick fix uh, to become rich overnight. However, I've got a different view. Unfortunately, it's not the case. Um, it took me over a decade to build a reputable brand to be recognized locally and internationally um, as a woman in this tough industry. Um, and for me to be able to contribute and uh, make uh, the relevant impact um, to be recognized um, um, nationally, like I said, and um, internationally. Um, as top 100 global um, influence on Amazon Watch uh, with the Queen of England, Oprah Winfrey, just to mention but a few. There are myriads of challenges um, that um, women face um, in the industry and I want to articulate a few. Um, being subjected to a lot of intimidation and sabotage simply because um, by male um, counterparts, simply because you're a woman, you know, issues of access to funding now more than ever before COVID-19 has a huge uh, bearing on majority of SMMEs, uh, particularly women contractors, since they do not have regular income and that has negatively affected their credit ratings, amongst other things, making it even harder to access the various COVID relief uh, funds that were announced by government. I'm also aware that uh, there are financial institutions or agencies currently working with government to assist with project financing. However, there are still stringent measures that one need to overcome to be able to access them. Access to market is one of the greatest challenges in the construction industry. The stringent measures that are set on public tenders make it difficult for SMMEs to compete effectively. The compliance requirements set on these public tenders are an impediment for women um, to compete successfully. Um, I think we all know about red tapes um, in the industry for women to undertake bigger projects um, um, still remain a big issue that I think would urgently um, require, require um, intervention. The construction industry was already in a worse off position prior COVID-19. Um, MEC, you also spoke about that, um, the lack of um, technical capacity. This is because majority of skilled laborers and professionals are migrating to other countries in pursuit of um, uh, better opportunities because um, we can provide them um, here, leaving the industry in a more dire situation. Um, if you look at um, Dubai, for instance, I, I think they have made the construction industry lucrative um, and for the professionals to thrive. Um, Subcontracting remains a big challenge. Um, it does not serve the purpose intended for big contractors exploit and take advantage of the small, um, the same small contractors they are meant to be developing and ultimately uh, leaving them vulnerable and in a worse off position economically and otherwise. Um, there's really no value add or development uh, with most of these projects, particularly for women. And I think we need to uh, put some um, emphasis um, on ensuring that um, we measure how these are done. Um, even though um, the women of 1956 marched to the union buildings for the anti-pass pro 
protests. Uh, it is important that um, in their online efforts, um, women are not only celebrated once a year in August. However, we should make it a custom to celebrate women um, on a regular basis. I want to applaud the Department of Human Settlement um, uh, in particular for taking a leadership role in empowering women in the industry under the leadership of the former minister um, Sisulu. This, um, however, still much more that needs to be done. Um, and I hope that the, the, the current minister, Minister um, Krubai, will take, will continue to ensure that um, um, we are in integrating all um, various aspects that are pertinent um, to the growth and success of women um, in the construction industry. Having said that, I believe that monitoring and evaluation for what they're doing um, should, be a, should be used as a yardstick to measure the output and ensure that tangible results um, are achieved um, in the industry in order to forge ahead. Um, in my view, the journey ahead is long and would require skills, would require willingness, will require experience and great efforts, really. We need to ensure that we are creating an enabling environment for women to play and grow in the industry. Perhaps men need to also learn to be more receptive, um, embracing and encouraging of women to take on leadership roles in the construction industry. In my view, we need to be intentional and deliberate um, in a quest to transform the industry and to open more economic opportunities uh, for other women, including the youth. Um, you mentioned, um, President, about the, the youth, um, you know, to participate. Um, though the... Um, uh, sorry, um, to, uh, procurement spend, sorry. Um, um, like, like, like I said, I think we need um, a president to make sure that these youth uh, participate um, through this, um, uh, though the president make mention of the 40% set aside for women, you know, the procurement spend, um, I think we need to make sure that there is direct or tangible um, implementation of this policy. And it's not just um, one of those um, um, statements uh, that, that are made and we don't um, enforce um, those statements. Uh, we also need to unbundle big projects um, to smaller projects um, um, to ensure that um, there's a lever um, that we, we, can, we can use to ensure equitable um, distribution of uh, revenue uh, for women across, across board, um, which would obviously um, ensure that um, um, women are placed at the center to benefit, to grow and build sustainable uh, businesses. Um, I see you are giving me a sign that I'm running out of time. Um, let me just, uh, am, I, am I okay? Can I have a, a minute? Okay. Okay, Honorable MEC, we are ready to support government in pivoting this good course. Um, as a way of building blocks, we can start um, in Gauteng and extend opportunities to other provinces um, to ensure the impact um, is realized nationally. Um, just as the women um, of 1956 knew that they had to take a stand to bring about change, it is entirely up to us now to ensure that we create an inclusive economy. To address challenges faced by women in the infrastructure industry, we need to create an enabling environment for women to thrive by building technical capacity, financial um, capabilities and other skills um, for women to have a tangible um, impact and, and, and remain sustainable. When women are empowered, families thrive, communities are safer and economies grow. And um, as I conclude, I believe that is imperative uh, for us to have continuous dialogue as women and um, engage further on how we can build an inclusive um, economy for all women, regardless of their race and age. Honorable MEC, I strongly believe that collaboration and synergies in the construction industry for women is suitable. And I think that we need to do so to enforce the set aside budget for women to collaborate with um, one another, which will position them to compete uh, with big construction companies led by their male counterparts, with bigger 
uh, within uh, the borders of South Africa and even beyond the borders um, of South Africa. And let's use these infrastructure projects as a catalyst uh, to build an inclusive um, eco economy. I, 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 I thank you. Webster, you are on mute. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Pertha. We now call upon uh, Mr. Sabel Obuteli as the Chief Director, Special Project Unit, Department of Higher Education and Training. Over to you, Mr. Butelezi. Mr. Butelezi, are you available? Unfortunately, it seems that he has lost connection with our, our session. Um, is it possible to go to Q&A Webster just for purpose of time? Yes. Um, okay. Now, uh, we, he will find us uh, 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 on the way. Uh, we are now on the moderator's question to the panelists, and this gives the panelists an opportunity to recap briefly on some of the issues they may have said in their opening remarks. First, uh, I direct my questions to Dr. Zolega Sikoko, uh, Chief Director, National Department of Human Settlement. Ma'am, how do you see the inclusive and equitable provision of housing leading the way towards economic recovery and restoration of human dignity? Two, how do you see the provision of good quality infrastructure in general? Uh, paving the way for the growth of the tourism industry because the country's well-developed quality infrastructure is a magnet for tourists. And tourism is regarded as one of the fastest ways of growing the e country's economy uh, because according to international formula, for every foreign tourist visiting a country, one permanent job is created. This appears to be a low hanging fruit for job creation and economic recovery. Your thoughts please, especially because Minister Kubai is the immediate first minister of tourism and is now holding an infrastructure portfolio, which is human uh, settlements. Your thoughts briefly, please. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think uh, for ourselves, um, uh, the, 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 the issue that you are asking about, particularly the issue of tourism, uh, is not our primary um, uh, objective in terms of infrastructure provision. Our primary objective is to ensure quality living environments for all citizens that are living in this country. Uh, that is the number one uh, ace that we are looking at. Yes, indirectly, you would be stimulating mm -hmm. other eco uh, uh, um, economies, um, the, uh, like tourism, like um, even your, 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 some businesses will start investing uh, their monies in the spaces that we have uh, improved. So we look at infrastructure, yes, as, a, as, as a stimulating uh, various economies, but our primary objective is to make sure that there's quality living environment that impact on the health and welfare of individuals and citizens of this country. Secondly, it has been proven, it's a pity that um, the Department uh, of Education uh, was not able to, to, to talk. However, it has been proven that once you provide the infrastructure that you need, you, the, 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 the dropout rate in, in, in schools, it decreases dramatically because now uh, children have a safe space to study. They have uh, access to water. They have access to, 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 to electricity. Um, so that's, that's, that's the, I think um, that's in terms of the, of the, of the, of the, of the good inf quality infrastructure, I think that's where we, we, we come in. And that good quality infrastructure, we are also making sure that also we in uh, uh, digitalization does not only start and end in, up in, in middle class 
suburbs, but also in those uh, poor environments that we start making sure that there's access to internet so that then it also improve also they are op the opportunities for them for the people to access jobs to access other means of um of a of a of a, 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 a improving their lives and also uh, the equitability i think by its nature um, the program of human settlements uh, addresses a number of um, key areas the equity issues the sustainability issues uh, integration issues, as much as we understand that we have not done well, especially with integration, but uh, we are deliberate now in ensuring that we're not only talking about spatial integration, we are also ensuring that then in our planning, uh, there's a economic integration uh, within within these various settlements. There's also also integration of uh, amenities that uh, sometimes can be lacking. So we're bringing other departments, not only Department of Human Settlements along. We have negotiated with various other departments to say, here are the spaces that we want to invest. Thank you, want Doctor. To... Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you, thank you, Doctor. Uh, uh, much appreciated. Um, Excuse me, Webster. Now, Excuse me, Webster. Sabelo is now on the call. Uh, Sabelo is back. Um, uh, Mr. Butelezi, uh, we want to give you a chance, and if you could uh, uh, then summarize, we had five minutes. If you could do it in two minutes, because we've been waiting for you, we're chasing time now. Uh, just to give your thoughts on the subject of economic recovery for economic uh, growth, just quickly your views. Uh, you're still going to take questions from me and the questions that are going to come from the stakeholders. Over to you, sir. Great. So it looks like he's dropped off again. I think there's an, a, a connection issue there. Perhaps we should carry on with the questions. Yeah, okay. I, I think I, I, I will get him later. Uh, now, uh, I move on to Honorable MEC uh, Mutara. Uh, Honorable MEC, how do we address some uh, lapses in the infrastructure provision, especially in the local government sphere, that manifest in, among others, a conspicuous disconnect between communities and elected and appointed leadership, which is a phenomenon I refer to as absentee leadership? That is mainly visible on the eve of every electoral cycle. Two, the perennial underspending of infrastructure budgets and mounting and consistent irregular expenditures thereof. Three, the feeling of exclusion by local communities in local economic development projects, which in turn results in some communities and pop up local business forums taking advantage of the situation by engaging in unorthodox methods such as extortion. Personally, having engaged with the representative structures of business forums on numerous occasions, I am of the firm view that the scope, skit, and donor approach to invasion on construction sites, which some stakeholders prefer, is a short gun approach that will never resolve the deep yearning for social justice by many marginalized communities and there will never be adequate police resources thrown at the problem until and unless we as social partners, government, business, labor, civil society consider a constructive engagement strategy with communities in terms of how best they can be included in local projects, whilst at the same time isolating real parts who are pursuing their selfish interests at the expense of genuine community concerns. It is these faceless tags that should be identified and met with the full might of the law as their actions not only break the law, but quite importantly, they defile and eclipse genuine community concerns. MEC, your thoughts please on absentee leadership and disruptions on sites, which have the effect of slowing down infrastructure delivery. Also, uh, please, what can be done differently to expeditiously remove regulatory inhibitors to private sector infrastructure projects as a result of ineffective and inefficient permitting and licensing system? For an example, building permits, a water use license, just to mention a few 
that take many years before they are granted, which in turn robs the economy of the much needed impetus for growth. Over to you, MEC. Thanks so much, Webster. I think let me um, start by the start of the last one in terms of the, the time it takes and the red tape, especially as it relates to, to, to the various regulations and regulatory framework that we have to adhere to. I think um, each of the departments that are responsible for these areas have got a responsibility to look at their own um, standard operating procedures and look at areas where they, where they can improve um, and it's got to be an, a continuous uh, process. Um, so my colleague um, who was meant to join us today, when he, um, he's now at the Department of Human Settlements um, as well as COCTA, but when he joined the Department of Economic Development about, um, it would be about seven years ago, um, they looked at that regulatory framework. And one of the, um, one of the, 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 so it's economic development and GDAD, agriculture rural development in the province, they are responsible for the issuing of EIAs. Uh, when he started, it took um, close to two years to be able to issue out an EIA, but just working on and continuously improving on their systems and standard operating procedures and looking at what it is that they can cut down to. They've now narrowed the issuance of EIAs um, to 30 days. And I know that, so in the province, we have what um, a political task team steering committee, uh, where we look at each and every department, um, what are regulations, regulatory uh, frameworks that everybody needs to apply for and go through, and then how we can cut down that time. So really it's about the will, but also being able just to understand um, what are the different tenants, tenants that go into this regulatory framework. If it's you yourself, and I think um, we've done that as a Department of Infrastructure Development with the municipalities, because a lot of what we do, um, of course, we, 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 we work in the same built environment and um, the building um, standards regulation framework. So we also work with municipalities in terms of um, just approvals of your SDPs, et cetera, et cetera, as, as an example. But what we've done is we have dedicated officials nominated uh, by city managers to support the work that provincial, the provincial Department of Infrastructure does. Um, so the turnaround time between ourselves and the municipalities is quite quick. And I think um, owing to, to that types of those types of interventions and just really um, you know, looking at better ways of, of adjusting your standard operating procedures, you also give more confidence to the private sector. Um, then you asked a question just about the, 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 um, the business forums, let me say that. Um, so yes, I think we do have to appreciate and accept that local communities do have a real yearning to participate in, in, in projects. Um, in opportunities, economic opportunities, especially. And of course, they are so few and far between. Um, and I always make the point that, you know, um, if you look at the different definitions of local, it depends which entity you go to. Local is defined differently across. Um, so local could be a ward in one area. It could be understood as a feeding feeder community of the of a service so if you're building a, a court for example um what is the feeder community uh so the, the the biggest challenge that we have is the definition of of local and then you also have the real um so you have we have to be able to separate um the criminal elements from those who genuinely want to participate mm -hmm. and want to participate as business people in business and business in the space um, you know, and I think if we if we have to look at um, what it means to 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 say that we have SMMEs that participate um, in the construction industry, they are given opportunities. They are also given opportunities to grow. You can't have a once off once off participation in an opportunity and expect that to be spun off in the SMME sector, um, because what happens when I'm done with building the school? all that experience and whatever you've learned over the 18 months goes to waste because um, there's, I can't build a new school in every single ward as an example. So I think we've just got to be able to look at, um, at, at really also looking at what is it that we want to achieve with, you, with locals participating in, in government spent and public infrastructure projects 
and how that must translate into economic recovery and SME participation and SME growth, et cetera, et cetera. So you can't have, um, and I see it a lot. We go, we go to communities, all of a sudden you have hundreds of construction companies registered. They all grade one. Um, but whether they understand the industry is something else. And also then you have a lot of back and forth between ourselves and main contractors just to be able to understand and get SMMEs to understand what is the contracts that they're entering into? What is their responsibility? How to run a business? And, um, and I think it's, it's just about understanding and getting that fine balance between the need to participate, but also the yeah. need to revive the economy through this local participation. And then the big issue that you speak about, um, I think, is just the underspending. I think underspending from ourselves, from ourselves, um, and even the, my department is also is guilty of that. And I don't think I have yet to see a department that doesn't underspend. Is just the long planning cycle that it takes. So if you look at IDMS, so if you're familiar with the IDMS infrastructure delivery management system, it is really a three a three way system. So you have the user department um, who is the, the owner of the concept and the plan and the project and also the holder of the budget. You then have the implementer, which is um, National Public Works or ourselves or human settlements, etc. And then you have Treasury, which has got to do its own compliance issues. And that just, and then you have the private sector participants. So in the, in the stages of in the stages of planning, it's the consultants, and then in the stages of construction is the construction companies. But that back and forth between the three government departments, often of the same sphere, and the consultants, and then later the construction company, leads to a lot of um, um, a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of time that is just spent. Uh, between that and um, and with the system, with the financial year system, if you haven't spent at a particular time, you've got to go through a rollover process. If you have met the haven't met the rollover process, you then have to um, surrender funds to treasury. And you often find that we surrender funds, and I think it goes back to just having um, that capacity. So. What we really struggle with in government is translating technical capacity to strategic and managerial capacity within the public sector space. So um, you could have somebody brilliant who has worked in the private sector, who is an engineer, et cetera, et cetera, come into the public sector, but not necessarily understand that um, bureaucracy, that environment of the public sector. And they are yes, unable yes. to translate their technical skills into what the public sector demands. Um, and yeah. of course, the turnaround times are delayed. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you, MEC. Uh, let me now uh, go to the president of NAFP, uh, Aubrey Chalata. NAFP president Aubrey Chalata, one of the epic failures of past and current administrations, especially in recent times in our country, has been the lack of implementation of public infrastructure bill program. Such an implementation failure, I would argue, is among other things preceded by the lack of proper consultation with the main representative industry bodies of contractors who have to actually build the infrastructure. Oftentimes, the government officials mistakenly think that they are consulting with the construction sector when they're speaking to the built environment professionals and suppliers to the industry, thereby uh, thereby uh, excluding the actual implementers of infrastructure projects and the contractors. One, given the state of affairs, do you believe that an infrastructure-led economic recovery for inclusive growth is possible without proper consultation and involvement of the main contractor associations in the planning, implementation, and maintenance of the infrastructure bill program? Secondly, uh, what do you think ought to be done to stop the demise of both emerging and established contractors due to non-payment of services rendered? Thirdly, how do you tackle the issue of corruption in such a way that it is not seen as a beauty contest between the public and private sector in terms of who is more corrupt than the other? Uh, fourthly, can transformation be sustainable without constant and reliable availability of projects for the emerging sector in an inclusive way? 
Over to you, President. No, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Mfeb. I think I, I will respond uh, uh, to your questions in the manner in which you've asked them. Um, I think it's a very critical time that we, we are in, particularly in the recovery space post the pandemic. And as we work towards economic recovery, it is very important. I alluded earlier to the um, driver of the recovery agenda. It's critical to understand who drives that recovery agenda. In the opening remarks, I made the reference to the type of leadership that we need to be looking at. Now, the challenge we are having is that it's very important for government and particularly government agencies that lead the built um, infrastructure program to understand where the leadership of the sector really lies and to isolate leadership of the sector that represents the sector itself and individuals who represent their interest. In other words, separate entrepreneurs from tenderpreneurs. There is a big danger, and this has been very clearly demonstrated in the Zondo Commission, that many a times government has tended to collude and consult and engage with individuals whose interest is to promote their individual agenda as against the agenda of the sector. Secondly, I think you alluded to something very important, the issue of suppliers versus contractors, as well as the issue of who really implements projects. It's said that at this stage, uh, in the leadership of the built and uh, uh, infrastructure program, the involvement of contractors, as an example, NAFP represents, as I said earlier, 7,014 members in all nine provinces. It's constantly been a struggle to engage with the leadership of this particular program in government, um, as well as those who drive it from the presidency in a manner that wants to say to them, how do you roll up this program in a recovery format, but include the thousands of contractors? It is no surprise that then you hear um, uh, officials suggesting that there are problems in the rollout of the program because they have literally excluded those who are key beneficiaries or who are key participants. Secondly, if you exclude major organizations like SAFSEC and the unions, like the National Union of Mine Workers and Bakau and others, in your engagement, you've actually excluded the bulk of labor. You've excluded 70% of the sector as represented as an example by SAFSEC. And those are contractors who are going to deliver the program. I'll, I'll always make an analogy, um, uh, Mr. Faber, of saying, you may not say to doctors that I want to consult on the administration of the vaccine and on treatment of patients, but I will not talk to doctors, but I will talk to pharmaceutical companies. Suppliers in our sector are like pharmaceutical companies. You cannot have pharmaceutical companies dictating to a doctor how to operate a patient and say I've engaged the sector because I've spoken to pharmaceutical companies that people will be healed as a recovery rate of patients will be high in hospitals because doctors operate in hospitals. I am saying contractors are the ones who deliver projects and therefore you may not implement the infrastructure rollout program for recovery if you exclude contractors, both emerging and established. So in a simple terms, I'm saying where you sit on the table and you do not see SAFSEC leading the established sector, you sit on the table, you do not see the likes of NAVB, you do not see the likes of APA, you do not see the likes of the uh, uh, Federation for uh, uh, Black Contractors on the table. You have excluded the thousands of the people who are supposed to implement those projects. That's the one part. The second part of your question related really to the issue of um, the payments. We've um, been arguing this issue for quite some time that we need to streamline uh, mechanisms through which main contractors and uh, emerging contractors are paid. In many instances, many of our members who are emerging contractors fail and their businesses close because the main contractors themselves are struggling with their issues of payment. I think it's about time that government steps into the fold and understand and practically implement this fast tracking of payment to contractors. On the issue of corruption, I like the characterization that you've put forward of a beauty contest as to who's more corrupt than the other. The truth of the matter though, is that the kind of leadership that we have both in private sector 
and in the public sector, um, irrespective of, 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 of where they operate. We need to have the kind of leadership that understands that corruption takes away from the poor, corruption deprives society of the most needed resources, because every cent that you take um, whether public or private sector, or whether there has been a, a, a dance between the two, as we've witnessed in the State Capture Commission, that you will find a, a private sector person corrupting a government official. Truth is that we've now, I like the characterization that President Ramaphosa pulled to say the Zondo Commission is a washing machine. We need to start putting um, uh, uh, all the dirty clothes into that washing machine from wherever they come, private or public sector, and so that we can have clean washing tomorrow. But it doesn't help to recycle those leaders back into the system. I think one of the things I will say very bluntly in respect of corruption is that we need to guard against both public and private sector, not retaining people whose names are tainted and people who've demonstrated that they have been corrupt in critical positions. And finally, yes, yes. I really wanted to suggest that it's important that we focus and zoom in specifically on the issue of creating jobs developing the economy, particularly focusing on SMMEs as creators of jobs and, and creators of employment. Thank you so much. Thank you, President. Thank you, President. Uh, I now go to uh, Dr. Petra, a Managing Director of Meds or Trading and NAFB Board Member. Uh, Dr. Julia Petra, the talk about infrastructure-led economic recovery for inclusive growth invoke some feelings of disillusionment among many women in construction as they always complain about insurmountable challenges because both the public and private sectors are alleged to be paying lip service to the mainstreaming of women in the economy. Your thoughts on how can we meaningfully turn the tide in favor of well-deserving women like yourselves, how do we cultivate a culture of ethical and conscious leadership from the women's perspective in order to allow a prominent role for women leadership, both in the public and private sectors? Over to you. I know you've addressed this issue, just to recap on some of those issues in a very uh, summarized way. Thank you, Doctor. I uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Febe, for uh, the question um, asked. Um, like I said, I um, um, alluded earlier on um, that uh, part of what we need to do um, to make sure that we are creating um, opportunities um, that women who are rightfully deserving uh, would be able to meaningfully um, gain um, these opportunities. I think we must have a program um, that would ensure that uh, public and, 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 and private in collaboration um, ensure that there's a seamless and um, a seamless process to make sure that um, these this, this women who deserve these opportunities uh, participate. Uh, the second thing is that I think that we must also um, rightfully unbundle these um, uh, projects because if you look at a majority of these uh, projects, they are projects at higher levels um, or that require um, CIDB grading that is higher. And um, it automatically exonerates um, women who are still playing and which is majority of women who are still playing within grade one to four to be able to participate um, meaningfully. So I think it's imperative that we unbundle these projects. And I know that um, Sandra and with what uh, Mr. Uh, the president alluded to earlier on um, with the mentorship, there's been quite a um, quite some, um, so some work that has been done in, the, in that area to unbundle uh, these projects. And, and secondly, uh, the issue of the 40% set aside, um, we must make sure that um, it's not just lip service, but there are budgets that are set aside. Because if you go to, um, um, if you go to government departments, um, and um, want to access the 40% uh, that uh, the government speaks about, you find that they do not have a, pro a program that would obviously um, uh, make sure that women participate uh, meaningfully economically um, and that is to access those opportunities. Thank you. 
thank you. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, we now go to Mr. Sabol Boteles. Is he now available? so that I can pose my questions. Can he indicate if he's uh, now available? Organizers? He is, is Mr. on. He he's is on. on. Yes. And now I'm going to pose a question to you, uh, um, um, uh, Mr. Butele is the Chief Director, Special Project Unit, Department of Higher Education and Training. Mr. Butele, is the white paper on post-school education and training sets out strategies to improve the capacity of the post-school education and training system to meet South Africa's needs. It outlines policy directions to guide the Department of Higher Education and Training and the institutions for which it is responsible in order, uh, in order to contribute to building a developmental state with a vibrant democracy and, and a flourishing economy. Its main policy objectives are a post-school system that can assist in building a fair, equitable, and non-racial, non-sexist, and democratic South Africa, a single coordinated post-school education and training system, expanded access, improved quality, and increased diversity of provision, a stronger and more cooperative relationship between education and training institution and their workplace, a post-school education and training system that is responsive to the needs of individual citizens, employers in both the public and private sector, as well as broader societal and developmental objectives. In light of the stated objectives, Dr. Mr. Butelis, how is the department realizing these objectives within the context of pursuing an inclusively growing and competitive economy with the requisite skill sets in partnership with the private sector and other strategic stakeholders based on measurable outcomes. Two, are we producing the right skills needed by an inclusive economy at the right pace and place? Pace in terms of meeting current demands and place in terms of adequacy and relevance to avoid skills mismatch. Your views, sir. Unfortunately, it looks like we have lost him again. Uh, in, in, in that instance, if uh, uh, let's go to the stakeholder questions in the interest of time. Uh, will Tracy read the questions uh, received online and then th uh, they will be clearly directed to a particular uh, a panelist. If whilst we are still going on, Mr. Boutelier comes back he can respond to those uh, questions if he has had them. Uh, over to you, Tracy, to read the questions that have been received. And our panelists, please be ready for the questions and note them so that we can respond accordingly. So there were minimal questions on the panel, but um, one, of, one of them was um, directed to Aubrey. Just in terms of um, how, how one de deals with racial discrimination at professional bodies. And then the second one is asking how the company who has a passion in SMME can get involved and partner with NAFB in this regards. Uh, uh, over to you, uh, uh, NAFB president, uh, answer that question. Uh, thank you very much. Um, let me start with the first question around um, uh, what uh, the, the question refers to racial discrimination. In, 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 in dealing with the issues of uh, registration of professionals um, in the built environment councils, what we discovered was that there was a huge backlog of unregistered uh, candidates. In other words, there are thousands of our young people who've graduated from universities um, who are in the candidacy program awaiting professional registration who were not being registered. One of the key things we found was that the situation was uh, created mainly by lack of mentors. There weren't uh, sufficient mentors who were available to be able to coach 
guide and, and, and mentor those particular candidates. Now, it's a historic fact that in the past, your traditional project manager, town planner has been a traditional middle-aged white male. And therefore, what young black girls, as an example, will find, as um, alluded earlier on by Dr. Petha, is that when they get into a candidacy program or at the workplace, where they are supposed to be exposed to various components of project management by their respective mentor, this um, male-female divide, um, um, a patriarchal arrangement, uh, uh, blockades a situation where this particular young a girl who has completed a degree in project management and aspiring to be a registered professional can be mentored. The solution that NAFPI has provided has been the one of cooperating and partnering with many government departments, as well as in, uh, municipalities to be able to mentor and coach. So our call today is still a call of saying for those qualified uh, female, black, um, white um, 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 uh, project managers, construction managers, and town planners, let's all come forward and lend a hand in mentoring and coaching the upcoming candidates. So in other words, to deal with the issue, uh, you need to have more and more mentors coming forward. And on the second issue of how can a company partner with NAFP, um, you may be able to contact NAFP via our website and make um, um, uh, or contact the organizers of this event to link us to, NAF, to link you to NAFPI, and we may be able to work with you. Our approach is one of mentorship. It is saying it is not easy for someone who starts a business today to be able to compete in, to, in this industry with so many challenges. They need to understand costing, pricing, estimating. They need to understand how to run a business. They need to understand how to tender. They need to understand the regulations that impact their tenders. They need to understand the playing field in the sector. And if there's no one to mentor them, they will be lost. So we offer that particular mentorship. And if a company has an interest in participating, they are more than welcome to make contact with NAF Bendula system as such. Thank you. Thank you, President. Uh, Mr. Butele, is, I guess, is still not available. Uh, uh, in that event, I just want, before I hand over to the next session, uh, just go back to MEC Mutara. There is a question that I raised, MEC, uh, uh, which I do not remember if you addressed it. Uh, you can repeat it, the disconnect between the communities and appointed and elected uh, uh, leadership, what I refer to as absentee leadership, because the anger of communities uh, due to the unavailable of the unavailability of leadership when they are confronted with service delivery issues causes this boiling anger to boil over to economic projects because they start by banning libraries, school, as a show of anger and trying to attract attention. And that culture that has been cultivated then gets transferred to economic projects such as construction on site. Could you please uh, just briefly attend to that uh, issue as to how to close that gap? Hi, yes, I think. Um, Somebody you know, must mute, sorry. Somebody must mute themselves. Please, everybody mute yourselves. Uh, sorry, Honorable MEC, uh, over to you, ma'am. Yes, thanks. I think, um, you know, um, Webster, to be fair, um, the, the question about availability or unavailability is quite relative. I think the, the reality is that um, communities have got um, immense expectations from political leaders. And I think when those expectations are not met, um, those are actually what translates into um, the violence or the um, unrest that you may see and the target of, of economic opportunity, uh, economic projects in the main. Um, I mean, even myself, I would be, um, I've been accused of not being available. You call meeting after meeting with different sec sections of the community. If they don't hear what they want to hear, um, it becomes um, a breeding ground for, 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 um, for that kind of action to take place. And it's not always possible to please everybody. Sometimes the situation just is what it is. And um, so, for example, we would have had um, a number of projects um, that were on the ground last year. 
um, closed due to COVID uh, for the period that, that they were forced to be closed for. And smaller contractors were unable to weather the storm. And post COVID, when we, re we, we restarted the projects, actually had to come to us to say that we now wish to terminate. Uh, we're not in a position to continue. Um, and we did that with, with each project by project. Now, if you say to a community that the contractor for financial and other reasons has decided to terminate, and we've got to go through the process of, of, of appointing a completion contractor, as an example, um, the community gets upset and doesn't necessarily understand that. And I think, um, you know, it's about the, the it's about what we have created over time, and it is this um, un, unfair and un, inexplicable expectation um, that, 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 that people have placed on government. I think government's main responsibility is to, of course, regulate, create a conducive environment, um, of course, yes, pro provide services, but there's many avenues towards doing that. And we, we work in a very, very um, regulated um, legal um, framework. And if we don't adhere to that, you will then have instances of irregularities and et cetera. And communities often um, don't necessarily care about um, irregular expenditure. They don't necessarily care about PFMA and your internal processes. What they just want to see is services on the ground. And I just think that over time, our lack of being able to adequately explain and make, take communities along with us has led to the instances where there's just um, expectations that are that are impossible to fulfill and communities that are generally left unpleased because it's not possible to, to, to please everybody. You will have some sections of society that will be happy that there's a school and in the same community feel that a school is unnecessary, they may need um, some other type of infrastructure. But what do you do? Uh, you've got to provide the service and you've got to take communities along to be able to understand the rationale behind some of your decisions. Thank you very much, uh, MEC. This is a subject we'll take uh, to the next uh, uh, meeting uh, uh, because the understanding of the local sphere of government was to bring democracy and services uh, closer to the doorstep of communities. Communities where in certain instances, there's a raw flu uh, sewage spilling in front of their homes with health hazards, manholes open, uh, complaints uh, over time, those not fixed. I'm, I'm referring to those particular uh, uh, situations, but uh, I, I do take your, your explanation that there are expectations. Perhaps uh, uh, my advice to government is to consider the Maslow's hierarchy of needs because uh, once you provide housing, a shelter, you think that you have provided, then when that need is satisfied, it graduates to the next need. They need jobs. From there, they need security, uh, the issue of crime and all that. If leadership understands that if they have given a uh, housing, uh, that is not the, the end of it all. Uh, that need has been satisfied and therefore you need to look at the next need. I now uh, hand over this session uh, to the youth advisory uh, presentation, whose theme is ensuring the resilience of youth in the built environment and creating a sustainable future. And I sign off by thanking all the panelists for their inputs. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I would like to extend my greetings to the panelists, the DMG team, my fellow youth advisory board members, and all the viewers at large. Um, my name is Asa Zita, and I'm a youth advisory board member of the African Construction Expo. Um, uh, just to share a short bio about myself, uh, I'm a third year construction management and quantity surveying student at the University of Johannesburg. Um, and today we're going to be addressing the topic of ensuring the resilience uh, of 
the youth in the built environment and creating a sustainable future. Um, to ensure uh, resilience, we first need to establish the role that the youth has in the built environment and the impact that they would have um, in an inclusive industry. And uh, the key aspects that need to be dwelled upon to create a sustainable future for the youth um, professional development, continuous development, and entrepreneurship. And um, just to highlight uh, the role that the youth has in the built environment, the major role that the youth has in the built environment, um, it's to, 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 to learn, apply, and innovate. Um, now, with little to no experience, the role of the youth is to absorb as much positive information as they can when they enter their respective industries and be able to apply that knowledge in order to come up with new innovative ways to boost production in their respective fields. And um, secondly, the youth have that new energy and curiosity uh, of which makes them question why things are done the way that they are done and do not base their day-to-day -day advancement on experience alone, but on new ways things can be done more e efficiently and uh, more quickly. Um, and lastly, about the role that the youth has, um, the youth uh, are more keen on, uh, have a more keen interest in technology and its advancement, which puts them in a better position uh, to learn more and implement systems like uh, building information modeling to solve problems that haven't even occurred yet uh, and make further improvements uh, 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 in, the, in the projects that they have. Yeah. And uh, just to touch on uh, the first key aspects of, to create a, a sustainable future, um, to be able to develop professionally, um, the youth need to be passionate about the industries that they're in uh, and try by all means to expose themselves more through platforms like societies, forums, um, webinars, whose focus is in line with their respective fields and not just focus on scoring high, high grades in school, which is also important, but they should try by all means to incorporate all of those in order to, 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 to develop professionally. Um, furthermore, the youth must engage with uh, industry professionals uh, by attending networking events like uh, construction expos, um, women's fellowships, um, construction forums, and engaging on professional uh, platforms like um, LinkedIn. And uh, um, as the Youth Advisory Board, uh, as the Youth Advisory Board members, we stand testimony to this because since joining the African Construction Expo in um, 2019, we've been exposed to events and professionals we never imagined would we would be uh, at this point. And uh, another point that would help uh, um, youth develop prof professionally is reading articles and researching, which speeds up the, the process of learning and induce both personal and professional growth. Um, um, lastly, um, um, the best and unmatched way for you to, to, to develop is through opportunities from companies uh, for field experience. Um, more like what uh, President Aubrey Chalata, President uh, Aubrey Chalata is working on achieving with youth improvement programs and mentorship. Um, in my own opinion, companies have the power to shape the future by investing in youth and giving them exposure and freedom to execute their ideas because given the opportunity and space, young people would show you on what they could do and achieve. Um, that's all from me. Um, handing over to the next speaker, uh, my colleague, Benjamin Depop. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, good
greetings uh, to the panelists and um, the DMG events company uh, team, and also everyone uh, who is watching uh, the, the event. Uh, just a correction is Ben, not Benjamin, it's only Ben. So yes, um, just a short intro about myself. I'm a construction management and quantity surveying third year student at the University of Johannesburg. Currently employed as student assistant foreman at the JC Fandrolende and Venter Project Construction Company. I also serve as, a, as the president of the Construction Student Forum at the institution. The president, uh, Opri, the president, Mr. Opry, has mentioned that there are various programs that are uh, that they are focusing on for women and youth in construction. And as a representative of the UJ Construction Student Forum, it will be a great honor as a forum to be part of the vehicle delivering the information on how to access such programs. I'll be focusing on um, continuous development, and my first point is mentorship. So. Mentorship is one key element that helps to bridge the gap between tertiary and industry. With more professional engagement and networking event for the youth, this will establish a platform for the students to access mentors and also enable us to uh, establish networks within uh, the industry. This will also provide guidance to students from the industry professionals and uh, also access to some of the industry information available currently. Next, next uh, slide, please. So one of the most uh, things that I've learned in uh, my experience, the most important things that I've learned in my experience is that uh, site experience uh, is uh, a practical, experience that ignites uh, inspirations in terms of our studies uh, while we are still at uh, tertiary institutions uh, and uh, other uh, colleges and stuff like that. Uh, my experience from a contractor's point of view is that uh, construction is a very technical uh, industry which requires any involvement of students for them to be competent at entry level. It requires a constant learning and development in the industry, which uh, I, I, I would like to emphasize also on, on, on uh, companies giving opportunities to students. And I was fortunate enough to be also given by uh, my current company, JC Fandrolende, uh, an opportunity to get site experience and how the industry works. So uh, on site experience as a recommendation to construction companies for training and education will ensure sustainable uh, transformation of youth inclusivity in the industry. With such engagement, students will be able to familiarize with such engagement, students will be able to familiarize themselves uh, with the traditional methods of construction. Uh, thus, this will enable the industry in the near future to adopt new technologies and also alternative choice of material. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so as an opportunity that was given to us also to be part of the construct, African Construction Expo and uh, Totally Concrete Expo, uh, as some of the ideas that I, I discuss with my peers is maybe if companies could, with products in the same market could invest in annual events where construction students are invited to participate, which is a platform where students from all over the country can witness showcase, uh, the showcase of uh, their product as companies, uh, the testing phases, you know, uh, familiarize ourselves with the new technology as early as possible so that when we get into the industry, we are able to uh, you know, to, to implement such 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 products and such technologies, this will provide obviously the 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 the, the, uh, the products with exposure to the the future uh, professionals that will be giving advice to uh, clients in the future. Uh, yes, so uh, 
This is uh, similar to our current event, however, more focused on students in general. And this will encourage skills development which supports transformation in the industry. Yes, can I have the next slide, please? Thibault, can I have the next slide? Okay, yes. Uh, creating a, a platform where students, this is uh, student challenges and competitions, which will create a platform where students can practice what they have been learning in class. Competitions such as tendering processes, bricklaying, you know, uh, and the usage of BIM programs, and also, you know, what have uh, we have uh, practiced, practiced uh, maybe for years is they uh, using uh, the model, structural model, concrete model, testing it and stuff as students. Uh, in this will also give us the opportunity to include high school students or high school learners, uh, whereby uh, tertiary students can engage and pay it forward to the high school students uh, in such participation. Uh, with all this engagement uh, as, as, as a, a youth representative, I think that it will give a crystal clear picture of uh, South African construction industry where it is headed. These activities will, will encourage more in innovative thinking from the youth, which will ensure a sustainable future of the industry. As uh, my lecturer once said, we need to think like there is no box instead of thinking outside of box. So uh, thank you so much. I'll uh, give it to uh, Tibo, my colleague. Thank you, thank you, Ben. Is uh, my audio good? Just to make sure. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. So I'm Tibo Kwena, um, a civil technician at Atari. I'm the CIC Young Members um, Vice Chairperson. And I'm also part of the Black Business Council Built Environment, BBC BE. And today I'll be talking more about entrepreneurship and economic inclusion. So I'm born in 1994, uh, in March 21st, which is Human Rights Day. Born in Kronstadt, a small town in the Free State. And I spent some time as well living most of my life in Gauteng in Pretoria and moved to Mafikeng for some time. Uh, thereafter, I came down to Western Cape to come and do my studies. And now that I live here in Cape Town, I've had the opportunity through doing small projects and also promotions to travel the country and actually notice how beautiful our country is. So now, just to give you an academic background, after I matriculated in 2012, I went to Pretoria Technical College, which is an FET college where I did my N4 to N6, where I learned a bit, a bit more about Tivit College. Thereafter, I went to NISA just to try and bridge um, my qualifications so I can do the national diploma. Um, thereafter, I went to Stellenbosch Business School, where I actually did entrepreneurship and management. And there, I got to learn a bit more about um, business management, entrepreneurship, innovation, marketing, and all of that, and also just uh, being part of different fields in the industry. Um, and then I completed my national diploma with CPUT, and now I'm currently doing my advanced diploma, which is the uh, new BTEC, basically, uh, in some engineering. So now, the reason why I'm talking about academics as an important thing is that you get to actually notice that going from different universities, you actually notice the different skills that are required and that you have a network of people with different skills and not everybody is excluded. So we do need Tibet colleges, we do need University of Technology students, we do need um, your university students who do more research. And when you bring that all together, the youth are an untapped resource. So, um, listening to one of the thought leadership talks that Lesecha Rekhanyakho has men, uh, said, um, presented, he said the youth are an untapped resource. And what does he mean by this? If you look at this, this was by UNESCO, the impact um, assessment. 95% of youth actually believe that they are able to change the world. However, the problem is 47% of the youth uh, lack access to these opportunities and 
to equip them with skills needed to make an impact in the world. So now UNESCO has the 17 sustainable development goals and these actually make sure that the rest of us in the world are actually meeting these sustainable goals and we are actually, um, let me say, qualified in each sense. So now one important thing that I did touch on was quality education. That's very important for us as the youth in built environment to make sure that we apply this knowledge and actually solve socioeconomic polarization. Um, another goal that's actually gonna be touched on today is gonna be about sustainable cities and also SDG 13, which is climate action. So if we can use these sustainable goals going forward, I believe that South Africa's infrastructure can be the best in the world and compare it to any infrastructure in the first world developing countries. So now I'm part of the Black Business Council uh, Built Environment, and these are the people that I've actually worked with in these committees. So Rifila Ludicha uh, started his uh, company, which is uh, 3D Print Crete, where they actually do houses using uh, civil 3D printing. And then on the right hand side, we have Kiriboni with a sister, and they actually own a, a business where they actually use recycled bricks. So they take plastic and they recycle it into bricks that are actually being used to uh, build houses. Now, how does this fit into the circular economy? So when we're talking about circular economy, we're talking about a way of actually including the four aspects that I mentioned over here, because social economic polarization is one of the biggest problems that we have in South Africa. You'll notice that if you go to a rural area, or a township, you are actually far away from so many things. But when you're in the city, you have so much access to things. So now, how do we actually bridge this gap? We need to bridge the gap with the skills that I mentioned earlier. So having Tivit colleges, uh, having um, the young entrepreneurs who are actually creating the materials and equipment to build with. And as my colleagues had mentioned that the professional development and continuous development happens. And also the panel did also mention mentorship. So if you bring all these together, we are creating a circular economy in, um, in our country, and not only just South Africa, but also in Africa. So through knowledge economy, this we can receive through research and development, our universities, and in the rural economy, if we can take people who are there and actually see these problems, we teach them how to solve these problems. They don't need to come to the city and develop it, but only they can actually go back to their hometowns in townships or rural areas and develop these economies there. So we need to make sure that we actually cover these four aspects, the knowledge economy, rural economy, township economy, and urban economy to ensure that we actually bridge this gap of social economic polarization and making sure that Africa is resilient. So now we did have these talks that youth are actually involved in um, making sure that we actually grow to become the future leaders in the built environment. So uh, MEC tomorrow, we did invite her to this event, which took place two weeks back, Women in Hard Hats, where she actually got to share the opportunities that are there for young women in the built environment. And uh, recently, we actually had this presentation where we're talking about a diverse and inclusive industry for our uh, future leaders. And what we're trying to say is that good leaders create uh, leaders. So what we came to a conclusion in the presentation was that we need mentorship pre-registration, uh, professional registration and post-registration so that we can actually ensure that this industry is actually sustainable and resilient. Um, just to touch on, um, or just in closing, let me say, as Bonang Mahale would say, lift as you rise. So as we keep on growing, let us not forget that us as a youth now, we are the ones gonna be the future leaders and once we actually uh, get that baton, we 
we want to pass it down onto the next generation. So it's important that uh, we actually look at this quote here on the left that says, I urge everyone to guarantee young people a seat at the table as we build a, a world based on inclusive, fair and sustainable development for all. What does this mean for us? As the youth, we hope not only to engage in infrastructure talks, however, to also continue to be part of the ongoing growth of a more resilient, sustainable African inf infrastructure development that gradually mitigates, eradicates socioeconomic polarization. And uh, since we do not have enough time to actually continue this talk, we do encourage you to actually invite us to be part of these types of platforms or invite the youth to certain committees and boards where we are able to actually discuss these um, issues and also be part of the implementation of these strategies involved in the National Development Plan and the National Infrastructure Plan. And do link up with us on LinkedIn or even on this platform where we can actually engage and continue to grow an inclusive and uh, economic industry for South Africa and Africa as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to our youth board. I'm sure that everyone agrees that it's such a compelling uh, presentation and you are definitely an untapped resource for us and we are looking forward to collaborating with you in the months to come and seeing you Thank at you. our 2022 event hosted at Gallagher next year. So now it's time to wrap. Um, I just want to say thank you for your time. Thank you to all our panelists. Even through these unprecedented times, there are big shoots of hope. We stand resilient and we stand together. Please enjoy this tribute for our irrepressible beloved industry. We hope to see you at our workshops and our digital talk series later. Enjoy and thank you. children we swung on trees hung on dreams paid flowers visits and captured bees unconscious investments now life is rather sweet we caged birds just to be free wandering souls conquered mountains barefoot chasing after rabbits after bad habits made innocent mistakes and belts were never known for waste we made granny run her back bent like branches reaching out for the sun will she ever taste the sweetness of her fruit the creativity of her juice her wrinkles history lines and remembrance of our youth we were young Naughty scenes in hiding, but when seen, hiding were ever seen. And we ran like we carried freedom in our feet. When streets were playgrounds before playgrounds were built on our streets. Tongues dressed in different speech. Loneliness dared not to befriend us. Tea and laughter for breakfast. Inhaled stories, now we own legends for breath. 
rich with yesterdays, we inherit a The past, the master, the future's a present slave I wasn't flexed then If time is money, memories are an investment